Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed on this platform by individuals, callers, or invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with the brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. That dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation to PayPal. The email is debatetalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Now, greetings and much love to all who are listening. Welcome to Debate Talk for you on Blog Talk Radio. You are now tapped in and listening to the sounds of the Man Up segment. I'm your brother, B.A. Abide. I'm hoping all things are well for people. It's been a long week. Enjoying this Sunday, just chilling and most high willing as the new work week continues to as it comes in, it won't be as heavy. So, um, but today, you know what? Hold on. Before I go any further, oh my man, Sal, you know, I always got to holler at Sal. Where you at, bro? Hey, I'm right here, man. What's going on, brother B.A.? It's always a pleasure to be back on the man of, man of seven with my brother B.A. What's happening with you, my brother? I'm good, man. Um, most high willing will continue to be more, a little bit more consistent with the man of segment. Um, the, the work schedule got kind of busy. Within, a, you know what I'm saying, but now things are slowed down a tad bit to where I can have more time to bring bring um, brothers on and build on some actual topics that make sense instead of ideology, man. I can't do no no more ideology. I've had enough of new conversations. Yeah, right? <laughs> I feel you, man. Got to switch it up a little something, something, man. Let's do it. All right, for sure. Well, today um, we have a special guest. I, I met this brother about maybe two and a half, nearly three years ago. In the bat chat, we used to have a lot of wars with various brothers um, on, on the Facebook bat chat and the messenger groups. And um, I, I noticed his scholarship, and I most definitely respected it and appreciated it. And at the time, I had just started tapping into the Near Eastern culture. I was just uh, getting into a surface level. And there were some things that he shared with me that I was not aware of while I was doing my early studies in it. So... There's a lot of brothers and sisters who call themselves by the name of Israel, and there's a lot of brothers and sisters who call themselves Christians. But what what's really kind of, what's really a disappointment is that we say we know the Bible, we say we know the Most High, and all these different things, but we're not in tune with the culture. We're not in tune with the surrounding social norms of the people who lived in this region called the Near East, because this is where the Bible is documented at. This is where when we read the scriptures, we see some cultural variants. We see cultural um, type. Um, we see things. We look at things in the scriptures totally different because we live out here in the West, in the Western Hemisphere. But for some reason, we're out of tune with the social norms and the culture of the scriptures. So I'm going to allow my brother to come in to introduce himself and speak so we get into the conversation. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. There you go. Hey, uh, nice to be here with you today. So, yes, um, I'm Wayne, Wayne Fillmore. Uh, people uh, on Clubhouse, they know me as Boy, um, but I'm Wayne. Um, I'm an avid studier in uh, the ancient Near Eastern culture. I've had a chance to rub shoulders with some of these um, ancient Near Eastern scholars in the field. Uh, I've written for BioLagos. I just got done uh, writing the first volume of my book. It's called Secrets of the Bible from the East. You can go grab your copy of that at uh, www. a as in apple n as in nicole e as in east a n e secrets. dot com. You can go grab a copy over there. It's a pleasure to be with you, bro. Most deaf man. And again, um, rather you be a Israelite claiming a heritage, or may or a Christian, we have to be honest and we have to get in tune with the culture and understand the social norms and the mindset of the writers 
when it comes to the scriptures. Um, I, I believe once we get more in tune with the culture and the social norms, um, I believe the community overall, whether you be Hebrew or Christian, we can be taken much more serious or we'll be taken serious rather. So my man, Void Aspect, my brother, Brother Wayne, uh, the floor is yours. Let me know if you need, to re- need me to read a passage from the scriptures. Whatever you may need, brother, the floor is yours. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and as I'm talking, I'm, uh, I'm opening my laptop so I can try and grab some sources as I'm talking. Uh, but, yeah, every, everything you said is true. Um, one of the things that I usually try and do when, when people usually meet me or when I'm talking to people about the scriptures, like you said, we have to start from the beginning, and we have to understand, and this is chapter one of my book, just about everything we know about the Bible is wrong, just about. Our conclusions are true. So our conclusions as far as God existing, God being real, God having a plan for uh, for all the nations to come back together, whether you're Israel, whether you're not Israel, our conclusions about God are true. But how we get to those conclusions today is very different than how people in the ancient or east came to these same conclusions if you time travel if you had a, if you had a, a and stop me anytime you have a question or anything like that but if you were to time travel for example and let's say you were to go back in time and meet i don't know solomon and you were to ask solomon some questions about how was the earth formed or if you were to ask uh, Solomon questions, for example, probably like, why does it rain outside? Or if you were to ask Solomon even certain questions about uh, some Tanakh passages, you know, what is Psalms 82 talking about? His answers for those questions compared to the answers that we have today will be really different. So uh, a lot of times you'll hear people say that the ancient Near Eastern culture is one of the many ways you can study the Bible. Have you ever heard it before? You ever heard it before, uh, before BA? The ancient and Eastern culture is one of the many ways to study the Bible, and you can study the Bible using uh, Reformed theology, Western hermeneutics, but I'm sorry, the Bible is an ancient and Eastern book. The only way to understand your Bible is through the East. I'm going to say it again. The only way to understand your Bible is through the East. So, that's basically just the introduction that I give people. We have to understand, and this is a, a saying that they have in Semitic studies, the Bible was written for you, but the Bible was not written to you. The Bible was written to a certain people at a certain time, and we have to understand their culture so we don't impose our culture onto what they're trying to explain. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely glad to be on the show. And uh, I think one of the topics – uh, we were supposed to talk about is uh, the, the, a little bit of the Trinity from an Eastern perspective, the Trinity from an Eastern perspective, and how that kind of ties in into what uh, I was telling you about with uh, Suzer and Vassal Treaties. Um, and like I said, at, at any time, if you have any questions or you want to follow up or anything, just just jump right in. But um, I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember a while ago we were having a conversation on uh, just different models of explaining the guy and explaining God. And as you know, B.A., I'm a Trinitarian. A lot of people will ask me, you know, why are you a Trinitarian? You study the ancient and Eastern culture. Is the, is the ancient and Eastern culture, is it, is it, is it kosher? Is it, is, it, is it Eastern? Because a lot of people, um, I've noticed it's become very popular. Once people get into the ancient and Eastern uh, uh, culture or Semitics, because people don't have a baseline for where they're studying from, people normally come to wrong conclusions. So it's great that now in 2022, a lot of this information is going out. People are getting into like the Book of Enoch. People are getting into the apoc- uh, apocryphal literature, the pseudepigraphal literature. But because people don't have a background in Semitics, they're coming to the wrong conclusions. So I want to go into uh, the Trinity and and how our idea of the Trinity today, our conclusion is true. Our conclusion is true, but how people in the East would have gotten there would have been different. So basically, 
when I talk to people online and when I talk to people out in the world, people think the Trinity just dropped out of the sky. They think that the Trinity is a brand new invention that Christians just kind of made up. And that's as far as their knowledge pretty much goes. People would normally say, well, show me the word Trinity in the Bible. Well, <laughs> I mean, the common objection to that is show me the word Bible in the Bible. Or people would say, well, show me, show me, show me some passages uh, where you can argue about a Trinity. And the problem is because we have to take a step back and look at this book from the East, we have really hard, we have a really hard time doing that. So in order to understand the Trinity, we have to understand something called accommodation. Accommodation, or uh, scholars call it divine accommodation, is the understanding. So this is a this is a belief within uh, biblical interpretation or uh, inerrancy. So this is the divine accommodation is a category in a section called inerrancy, right? So divine accommodation basically says that when God communicated with our ancient ancestors, the Israelites, God communicated with the Israelites according to their cultural context in a way that they could understand. So when God spoke to the Israelites, he had to speak Hebrew if he, if he audibly was speaking to these people. And if God showed an Israelite a vision, he had to show an Israelite a vision that used reference points and things in their culture they would have been familiar with, or else the dream or the vision or God audibly talking to this person, it wouldn't make sense. God showed an ancient Israelite modern science or modern physics or modern math or a modern skyscraper they would not be able to understand what he's talking about. So God accommodated with the Israelites in the same way that you would accommodate um, with somebody from another country or from somebody in another culture. You would use reference, reference points from that person's culture, uh, from where that person is from, so they can understand what you mean. So when God revealed himself to the Israelites, God used what was around them. Notice on very old Jewish prayers, the first uh, couple of lines in Jewish prayers that usually start off with, blessed be God, king of the universe, great king, king of the world. God first relates himself when he's talking to the Israelites as a king because that's what the Israelites know. The Israelites know what a king is. They know what a kingdom is. So when God is speaking to the Israelites, he accommodates with them. As a king. Now, is God an actual literal physical king that actually physically sits on a physical throne? No. But when God is revealing himself to the Israelites, that's how God is revealing himself to them in a way they can understand. So when it comes to the Godhead, and I said, be honest, uh, can I still be heard? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. When, it, when it comes to the Godhead, we have to understand culturally what was going on around their time so we can get a better understanding. And so I'm going to go into this, and then I'm, I'm actually going to get into the meats and potatoes of uh, how the Trinity is true, but it's not true in the way that we would think is true today. It's, it's, it's completely different. One figure in the Bible that people have been arguing about for a very long time is the angel of the Lord. Christians will say the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Some people will say the angel of the Lord is Metatron. Some people will say the angel of the Lord is whoever, the, whoever he is. People argue about it. And there's a lot of argumentation about who this figure is because we don't understand kingdom hierarchy in the ancient Near East. So in the ancient Near East, the type of kingdom hierarchy that they had, and this is the meat and potatoes of what I'm actually about to start getting into. The type of kingdom they had in the ancient Near East was called a suzerain vassal kingdom. So what a suzerain vassal kingdom is, is actually what you see in the Bible.
but you may you may not know it. So a suzerain or a uh, 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 suzerain just means sovereign. So you would have a high king. So you would have a king who would be the most high king or the king above all the kings in his kingdom, right? Hence why we call God the most high because he is the highest of all the other kings. So you would have a high king and then you would have the vassal. You would have a vassal king or a king who would submit to the high king. So in the ancient world, kingdoms usually didn't have just one king. Kingdoms would have multiple kings. A kingdom could have as many as 50 different low kings or suzerain kings. I'm sorry, vassal kings. You could have at least 50 different vassal kings in a kingdom. So you would have a high king, right? You would have one high king. You could have many low kings. But sometimes what will make one of these low kings or one of these vassal kings unique is sometimes the lower king would be the king's son. And people who believe in the New Testament should start understanding this language I'm talking about. But this is, this is right now, this is a strict Old Testament, pre-Jesus. In the ancient world, you will have a high king, you will have a low king, right? You will have a suzerain, you will have a vassal, and sometimes the vassal would be the son to the king. Or sometimes the vassal would be referred to as a messenger, the word of the king, right? So that's kind of like ancient Near Eastern slang. Sometimes the messenger of the king would be called the word of the king. And the king, uh, the messenger would go back and forth in between different nations and different kingdoms. And the word, the word of the king, who would sometimes be the king's son, that would be the vassal king. And when the vassal king would go before other nations, although these suzerain kings, they never met each other, they spoke to each other. And you can actually uh, get this quote from uh, it's a book called Letters of the Great Kings by Trevor Bryce. Look that book up. This, uh, what, this quote I'm about to quote, uh, and it's not verbatim because I don't have a book in front of me. Uh, you can find that quote in that book. Uh, it's a letter by Queen Padefa, and she's writing on behalf of the Pharaoh Ramesses. And in the letter, Queen Padefa says, uh, so she's asked, she's acted as Ramesses talking to another king. And in the letter, she says, though us great kings are brothers, the two have never met each other. It is our messengers who speak to us face to face. So that should bring a lot of callbacks to these episodes where people are talking about they saw God, but if you see God, you'll die. But then people say they see God, but then God is a man, but then God is called the angel of the Lord. So they see God, but then they don't see God. And the reason why that's so confusing is because we don't understand that in the ancient Near East, when a king would send out his son or he would send out a messenger, it would be as if you would be speaking to the king himself. So basically how suzerain and vassal kingdoms work. So let me speak. Would you mind yeah. if I call you to to my brother? Yeah, very good. I, I was waiting for you too. I was waiting for you too. <laughs> my apologies. Like just as you brought up, like you just said a few moments ago, how it was believed that they saw this representative that the, it was like as if they talked to God or they knew not to disobey because if they if they disobeyed the messenger, they knew they were disobeying God at the same time. Or sometimes yeah. it was considered to see God. Like when you read in Judges chapter 13, we see that example. We see uh, the parents of uh, Samson. They are talking to an angel or a messenger. Some people say that it was the angel of the Lord. Some people interpret this that it could have been Metatron. I even heard people say that it was Christ in his preexistence. I've heard various different interpretations. So or beliefs on who they believe this figure could have been. So when they presented so when this angel had when they, when they called themselves trying to present a sacrifice before this angel, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, No, I'm not the one. 
And then when he descended into the smoke, because there was a fire that was lit, and he descended into the smoke and went into the heavens. And they were in fear to look upon God. But this mm-hmm. angel said that he, that he was not God, that he was not the one to present a sacrifice to him. So we see right there if that makes any sense. Yeah, man. Yeah, we 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 see stuff like that throughout the Bible, and I, I have an interpretation of uh, of Judges thirteen too. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm gonna bypass that and just just get back to the to the to the straight meats and potatoes of it, because we we keep having these arguments because we don't even understand, uh, we don't even know the, the names of these terms. We don't know that Yahweh in the ancient world is a suzerain. We don't know that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is what's called a vassal. So when certain things are going on in the text, we don't know what's going on. To us, these are just random things happening for no reason. But when you understand your Bible from the cultural perspective, you start to see that none of this is random. It's an order. It's a. I mean, a, a lot of times you hear people always argue about there's a hierarchy in the kingdom of God. Duh, there is a hierarchy in the kingdom of God because when God is revealing himself to the Israelites, God is revealing himself in the form of a kingdom that the Israelites would have been familiar with, with the kingdoms that would have been around Israel. Israel didn't live in a bubble. Israel had a lot of other nations surrounding it, and Israel would have been really privy to what was going on in these other other nations. But that's basically the, the, the suzerain vassal uh, kingdom hierarchy. Um, now, next, you would have – so you would have a suzerain. You will have a vassal, and then you will have a vassal kingdom or a vassal land. And so what would happen is um, the suzerain and the vassal would make a covenant between each other, and then the vassal would mediate between the people and the suzerain. You actually, you actually could put your Bible down, and you can see this actually in Egypt. In Egypt, you had your pharaoh, and then you had your vizier, and underneath your vizier, you had, like, your priest. It's pretty similar to Israel, but the vizier um, was a mediator. He was kind of like uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? He was kind of like a wise councilman, basically. Uh, he, he was a person like wise counsel, the vizier, and people would go to the vizier, right? I'm talking about the normal everyday lay people. They would usually go to the vizier. And then the, the vizier would state a request or whatever to the king. And us as believers in the New Testament, all of this stuff, like, should start making certain memories about certain Bible verses start clicking in your heads. So the vassal king would mediate for the people, and he would go between the, the high king and the people, and he would mediate on their behalf. We know this language as New Testament believers in Yeshua or Jesus. We know this language. We just don't know what it's called. We just don't actually understand uh, the the coach, the context behind it. But we know we know this stuff. So, going further, it was customary that when one king would topple another king, sometimes he would take the, he would take that king's people. And I'm being facetious and sarcastic here. And the people would be so thankful that this this king freed them from their evil uh, prior king. This new king will make a new covenant with the people. And who was the king that God toppled so that he could have the Israelites as his people? The Pharaoh. The Pharaoh. God topples the Pharaoh when he gets his people back. And so it was customary when you toppled a king or when you took a king's people, you made a covenant with them because they were thankful for you saving them. And what covenant does God make with the Israelites? The Moses Mount Sinai covenant. And if you look at the Mount, the Mount Sinai covenant, I'm going to see if I can pull it up on my laptop as I'm talking. The covenant at Mount Sinai, it actually parallels to other ancient Near Eastern covenants um, in the East. One, for example, would be the Hittites. Um, the Hittites, they have suzerain vassal treaties as well. You can find some of them online. They're pretty hard to track down. I'm going to see if I can find one as I'm talking. But 
we a lot of times, uh, like I said, it's hard to figure out what's going on in, in the text because, you know, this is a 3,000-year-old book. This stuff happened long ago. Let's see if I can find this real quick. But, but uh, even – can you hear me, brother? Yep, I hear you loud and clear. Yep, I hear you. Mind of what you're saying, again, the most high, he's conveying the message to, to the Israelites that they will understand because they are living amongst these different nations. Uh, they lived in Egypt for a time. And prior to that, the sons of Jacob, they were around different types of people. So it was common for them to understand or to be aware of what the other nations outside of them lived by. And so when the Most High is talking to these people, he's using these social norms to so they can identify with what the message that he's conveying to them. So that's very key. And and we're not saying and we're not saying that the Most High is stealing things from the other nations. We're not saying that. He's using these things that they're familiar with so they can understand what he wants to establish because he is the superior Lord over all. Just want to just add that to the to the to the mix, just in case someone tries to say we mixing this and saying this and saying that because you know, just like for years I've been knowing you, bro. They'll take your words and twist it, and even like on Clubhouse, they'll take your words and just say you said something that's not what you're saying. Just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, bro. Nah, they're they're not stealing, and but like in in Semitic they call it cultural borrowing, and like no culture, even even today. Like people don't just come up with new cultural norms out of nowhere. We ha- we have to use what we're familiar with because no human starts off with a blank with a blank slate. So obviously, you know, if you're making a new nation, right? Just like just like in America, America took some laws from from Great Britain when America decided to break away from Britain and become its own nation. And we even like we speak English, which is a variation of the Queen's English or the King's English, whatever you want to call it. So we like we as people, that's just what we do. That's just a part of being human. We culturally borrow and that's okay. But with that being said, um so there's a couple uh there's an outline for how a suzerain vassal covenant um is supposed to go. So what I'm saying is there is a method to God's madness when God brings the Israelites out into the wilderness. He's not just doing this for no random reason. He didn't make Moses go to Mount Sinai for no random reason. A lot of times we don't understand the continuity in the story because we don't understand the context. We don't understand what God is doing with these people because we didn't live there 3,000 years ago. But usually in a suzerain vassal treaty, right, so when when a king would make um, a covenant with his people, by the way, this is how the Bible is unique. The Bible is the only text where a deity or a God makes a covenant with a people. And not only, not only is the Bible unique in that God makes a covenant with a nation of people, but God makes a covenant with a nation of people who used to be slaves. That was unheard of, and it still is unheard of in the ancient world till this day. That is unique. Very but unique. You, uh, very unique. Very, very, very unique. Because if you look at the other gods and the other religions, the other gods treated people like they were slaves. But we know, especially just skipping to the New Testament, Christ says, I no longer call you my servants, I call you friends. The only God to say that. The only God to say that. So uh, going back to the, to the Old Testament, though, there is an outline for how Susan and Vassal covenants were done. So we're familiar with Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Well, God isn't just like randomly saying that for no reason. So that is how introductions were made in these covenants. You would have both parties introduce each other. And the king that freed you or the king that uh, helped you in your battle or in your war, in your liege, they would introduce themselves. Uh, Right now I'm looking at a Hittite uh, suzerain treaty, and I'm just going to read from 
uh, the, the preamble. Hey, what's the These name? Are, it's a Hittite. Oh, what's the name yeah, of that it's, source? It's, it's Hittite Suzerain Treaty. Okay, is it like yeah. an article? Um, if you name uh, the article, so this is from JulianSprings.co.uk. Uh, I think they so they got this from uh, I think it's the Brooklyn Museum, and they they took a copy of it and they put it on his website. But it's called uh, JulianSprigs.co.uk slash pages slash Hittite Treaty. And if you uh, if you type it in on Google really quickly, it might come up. Julian Spriggs, that's J U L I A N Spriggs S P R I G G S dot C O dot U K slash pages slash Hittite Treaty. H I T T I T E Treaty T R E A T Y. So that's the source I'm reading from. So you have your preamble and in your preamble this is this is basically like the introduction before the introduction and and the the two parties would introduce themselves basically. So here it goes. These are the words of the son, Mercilus, the great king, the king of the Haiti land, the valiant, the favorite of the storm god, the son of Supi the Lumis, the great king, the king of the Haiti land. The volume. So that's the preamble. You know, these are the words of such and such. Uh, so that's kind of like like the preamble in uh, Exodus 20, right? And like a preamble is, is 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 basically this this royal introduction of this king. And so God is introducing himself in his preamble in Exodus chapter 20 as the king who freed them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So then you have your historical introduction. Uh, so this is from the Hittite Treaty. Uh, Azarius was the grandfather of you, and the you in the text is talking about this king named Dupi Tassa. So this is the second person in this treaty. This is a treaty between this king called Dupi Tassa, and previously in the preamble, the person making the covenant is called Supi Lalumis. So Supi Lalumis is making a covenant with this other king named Dupi Tasab. Azarius was the grandfather of you, Dupi Tasab. He rebelled against my father, but submitted again to my father. When the kings of Nahasi land and the kings of Kenza rebelled against my father, Azarius did not rebel. As he was bound by treaty, he remained bound by treaty. As my father fought against his enemies in the same manner fought Azarius, Azarius remained loyal toward my father as his overlord, right? And did not incite my father's anger. My father was loyal towards Azarius and his country. He did not undertake any unjust action against him or incite his his or his uh oh his or his country's anger in any way. So I'm just going to skip down to because it's pretty it's pretty lengthy and I don't want to be here all day reading through a Susan treaty but it's pretty lengthy um, but in your Susan investor treaty that that that's basically what it sounds like it's these two kings and one king is making a covenant with another king I saved you from this or your great grandfather was the that he was the he was the vassal to my grandfather so now I'm going to make you my vassal. That that type of thing going on. So you have you will have your preamble, you will have your historical introduction, you will have your uh future relations, you will have your military clauses, you would have your invocation of the gods, you will have your curses and blessings. You see that in Deuteronomy, curses and your blessings. Every covenant had curses and blessings. If you follow this, this will happen. If you don't follow this covenant, this will happen. That's not unique to the Bible, guys. That isn't every covenant in the ancient or east. That's just how covenants went. That was a part of everyday life. Uh, so you had your curses and blessings, and then after you had your curses and blessings, the last part, you had your divine witnesses. So that's mm. basically that's basically how it went. And I'm I'm going to just paraphrase. There's a whole lot of stuff to go into. But 
you see this when when Moses goes to Sinai. So now we understand what's going on. So the way how the Mount Sinai account is playing out is playing out roughly in the same way or the same outline any other suzerain vassal covenant played out in the ancient East. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't completely crazy to go to a mountain and to make a covenant with a God. Also, as you guys probably know, in the ancient Near East, um, why did God take Moses to a mountain? Because in the ancient Near East, that's where God's lived. God's lived on mountains. God's lived on mountains in the ancient Near East because mountains were up really, really high. And it seems like at some point, if you're looking <laughs> so far away, those, those mountains look like they... They touch the heavens, bless you. Yeah, sorry, if, if you're looking from, from, no, it's cool. If you're looking from far away, from far off in the distance, sometimes it looks like mountains, they actually touch the sky. So ancient people would say mountains were places where heaven met earth. That's why people would make temples on top of mountains, because the mountains are the highest place on the world, and that's where heaven meets earth and so people will make their temples on top of mountains and basically the, the the temple would be the command center but that's why moses goes to a mountain because that's where god lived at in the ancient world like god lived on mountains and we know when, when moses goes inside the mountain you know he you know the floors have like these beautiful clear floors and it just looks amazing it, it, it looks like a palace when moses goes inside the mountain but usually what would happen is when people do a suzerain treaty. So let me let me explain what's going on with Moses. A representative of the people would go to the palace so they could work out the deals of the covenant with the king. That's what you see going on with the Moses account. It was common for the people to have a representative and go and eat with the king. They would share a meal together. After they would share a meal together, they would work out a covenant. After they worked that covenant out, you know, like I just said, the covenant will have an outline. It will have your preamble. It will have your introduction. It will have your military clauses. Actually, I want to read from the tablet really quick. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, give me a second. Why you getting that, my brother? Uh, just remember, we're we're giving people a historical and a social perspective of the ancient Near East, the environment and the geographical region and location where our scriptures were documented. It's very important to get in tune with this mindset. We're not saying it's the end all be all to understand God's word, but one thing it will do it will help you in your studies. If you're calling yourself a Hebrew Israelite, and, there, and there's various Hebrew Israelites in the community who have brought this stuff out. Uh, my sister is Sean Doc, Brother Ron Divine Prospect, um, and various other individuals. But this is still new to the majority of Israelites. This is still new, and that's fine, because in the scriptures it says we will always be forever learning. So we're just giving a perspective that's not common. Just because it's not commonly taught don't mean we made it up. This information is as old as anything else. Just want to say that real quick, brother. Yeah, man. It, this stuff is really old, bro. This stuff, um, scholars found out about a lot of this stuff in the 1800s, but it's, it's, it's new to us. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely is time for this stuff to be brought out again. But I found what I was looking for in the tablet. Um, in the Hittite Suzerain Treaty, so it has military clauses. And the military clauses, they line up with, give me a second, I think it's uh, Exodus 23.20. It is. It's uh, Yep, it's Exodus 23.20. So this is Exodus 23.20. I'm going to read from there first. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now, in this Hittite tablet, 
listen to the language of the military clauses in this Hittite treaty. With my friend, you shall be friend. And with my enemy, you shall be enemy. If the king of the Haiti land is either in the hurry land or in the land of Egypt or in the country of Astara or in the country of Alsat, any country can dishes to the territory of your country that is friendly with the king of the Haiti land or any country can they just to the territory of your country that is friendly with the king. It goes on to basically just say, yeah, this is a run-off sentence that goes on for a long time. But basically, it 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 it, go, it, it, it follows along with the Exodus 23 language, um, where God tells the Israelites, my enemies will be your enemies. Your friends should be my friends. That was common in Ancient or Eastern suzerain vassal languages. God is not doing something new. The Israelites would have very well understood what was going on. Oh, what did you say? I'm sorry. I heard you say something. I thought the call dropped, but nah. But keep going, brother. Yeah. So, so, so God is not doing anything completely different with the Israelites. So, I'm going to read from Exodus 23, uh, 20. And I'm going to skip to 25. And there's a method to my madness. I'm going to say that now. I'm going to kind of try and tie everything together. So this is God speaking to the Israelites in Exodus 22, 20. He's, he's, he's speaking from the cloud, right? And he says, behold, I send an angel before you. Or behold, I send a messenger before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him. And obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now, if you go to verse 25, look at this language. You shall serve the Lord your God. The Hebrew says, you shall serve Yahweh Elohim. You shall serve, you shall serve Yahweh Elohim. And he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. Do you see the word play? He will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. It's switched from the third person to the first person, and they're both going to be blessing them in two different ways. He will bless mm. their bread and their water, and Yahweh will take sickness away from among them. Why did that happen? What is going on? Because the messenger that God is sending before the Israelites is a vassal king to Yahweh. He's a vassal mm. king to the suzerain king. That is why, that is why, their transgressions will not be pardoned because he is a vassal to the king. And when you're dealing with a vassal to the king, it is as if you are dealing with the king himself. That is what's going on in the text. Mm. So, yeah, if you got if you got any questions, feel free to ask me, man. <laughs> you, you know, brother, you brought something up that was very, that, that stood out about the Most High making the covenant with people who were <laughs> so set it all yeah, set, set it again. you said, said, uh, the, you said uh, earlier it, what was unique about the Bible is that we see the Israelites the most high is making a covenant with the Israelites who were former slaves yes yes in the world that was that that was something that was not that was very rare but when we look in the scriptures, we see the Most High being a servant to his people before they even got a chance to serve him. And even when you go into the Garden of Eden, when the man, the human being, or when Adam and Eve was placed into the Garden, it says in Genesis chapter 2, I think it's Genesis chapter 2, I think it's 16, verse 16 or 15, I can't remember at the moment. It says that he put the man inside of the Garden to abide to work and dress. The word for in the Hebrew for work means it's a bod. It means to be a slave. Ain't that something? Wow. And we see, <laughs> and we and we see the word dress 
means to be able to, to take care of it, to be obedient. So before the man was put in the garden, who was the first servant? Who was the first slave? The Most High. Because he gave them everything they needed. So when we mm-hmm. say that the man or the human beings or male or female, that we are creating the image of God, we are created to mimic the things that he did first, to be servants and to serve one another. And then you see Israel being slaves at one time and Egypt being treated, being mistreated and everything else. And guess what? Um, they're going to become servants. By serving the Most High, how they prove they belong to the Most High to confirm the covenant by serving each other and serving the nations. <laughs> From right, but hold on, check this out. And then the Master Yeshua Himself said, "The greatest among you shall be your minister." What does minister mean? Mm. Sir, to be your to be your servant. The greatest among you shall be your master. I mean, shall be the greatest among you shall be your minister to serve you. The Messiah washes through his feet. Think about that. This is a rev- this is revolutionary. And check this out. I'm gonna say this. The priest, they do the work of the kingdom or the work of the temple. Think about that. The priest they serve. And we see this right here. That's what makes this that's what makes the covenant with Israel. That the Most High made with them very unique because he's teaching them a whole nother way of thinking, a revolutionary force. So when we hear the gospel being preached in the New Testament, well, I, I believe the gospel was preached throughout the whole book, if you ask me. Yep. Yep. We even see, we even see Abraham. When you look up the word bless in the Hebrew, it means to bend, to serve. He said, I will bless you that will... I will bless those who will bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. That means yep. if you show love to the Abraham, you will also be served and protected. And you also will get the benefits of you will also reap the benefits of the truth of Abraham. Ain't that something? Yeah. <laughs> Just want to bring it up real quick, but go ahead, brother. No, it, it's fine, man. And, and, and here we had people in some of these doctrines, man, saying that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say this, and then, and then I'm gonna move on saying that in the kingdom, you know, they're, they're gonna have slaves and yada yada yada. You know, when the kingdom of God comes, they're gonna have slaves in the kingdom of God. I can't get with that doctrine, man. I can't rock with that. Jesus said the greatest among you will be a servant. So, <laughs> but move, moving on, um, but yeah, that's that's what's going on. That is what is going on in the text. Um, God is revealing his kingdom in a way, in a cultural way that they can understand. If God spoke to us today, if the Bible had to be redone all over again, and let's say God started off brand new from scratch and he raised up his a nation of people from America. Well, in America, we don't have a monarchy. We don't have a king, right? We have a president and the president has a cabinet. So, if God revealed himself to us today, instead of accommodating and saying that he's a king, God would probably say that he's the president of the world and that he has a divine cabinet. You understand? So we have to understand that God is expressing uh, what heavenly things are like to these people according to their culture and a way that they can get it. And that's not bad. That's not evil. Um, that's just how humans are, or we're not going to get it. Furthermore, if you go to uh, Exodus 23, verse 25 again. So remember, I just said that what's going on is God is sending the Israelites his vassal king so that the vassal king can lead them into the land. Now, if you go to verse 25, that was the verse I just read from where it says, you shall serve the Lord your God. The Hebrew there is very interesting. If you go to the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for serve is, and I'm going to put my phone on speaker, and I'm actually going to let my uh, my live out for actually tell you what the Hebrew word is. Oh. Avad. Avad. I'm saying one more time. Avad. Avad. 
So that word, abide, it means to work or to serve. But in its most literal sense, it means to serve or to worship a deity. Or and be a slave. That word, or be a slave. Now, if you go to the book of Judges, chapter 2, there's a scene where the Israelites are caught red-handed in the cookie jar worshiping the gods of the Canaanites in the promised land. And the angel of the Lord catches them. And it starts off and it says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I bought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give you to your fathers. But remember, when I reference Exodus chapter 20, Yahweh said he brought them out from Egypt. You see, you see what's going on? He's taking credit for what Yahweh has done. Because when you see the angel of the Lord, it's like you're speaking with the Lord himself. Exactly. Yeah. And I agree with you. And it also because the reason why, because the Most High said my name is in him. People mm-hmm. would probably think that it's his literal name, but it's but that Hebrew word for name is Shem. It means his character, his essence. Right, you know right, I mean? right. His reputation, his reputation right. Rep, representative or representation of him. That's mm-hmm. what that means. So when that angel in Judges chapter 2 is speaking as if he is the Most High, the Most High has given him that authority to speak. What other yeah. place in the, in, the, in the scripture speaks like that? There's only one. There's only one that speaks like that. Mm-hmm. He said, my sheep know my voice. Yep. 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 Which, 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 is, which is why, real quick, if you go to, if you go to Judges 2, chapter, uh, Judges 2, verse 11, it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the bells. Now, go back to Exodus twenty three twenty five. 25. What did God tell the Israelites to do with this angel? You shall serve Yahweh Elohim, and he will bless your bread and your water. In the same way that the Israelites served bells, the God of Israel told them to serve this angel. And here's, here, here, here's a here's a anchor passage to go along with it. Here's the anchor. If you go to John 5.22. Actually, John 5, 23. This is Jesus speaking. I'm going to read from 22, though. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Uh In the same way the angel of the Lord was sent, and the people were to serve or to honor the angel of the Lord in the same way they served or honored Yahweh. Jesus is using the same language in the New Testament. And he says, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Like a messenger, like an angel, Jesus is saying that he was sent. This is Uh-oh. why you need to understand the cultural context of your Bible. You didn't say that. <laughs> you say that. Those they they go grab the stones, man. They go they go try to they go try to crucify you, man. Now they go drop the stones and try to hang you at the cross, man. Uh oh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that man. <laughs> so hey man, it's 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 in there, man. It's in there. We just gotta understand context. Um and it's 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 a it's a whole it's a whole another layer to it. Well, you know, if it was so clear, how come God didn't just tell these people that it was Jesus to begin with? Why the games? Why the mystery? Why? That's a whole other thing. But, you know, God works through types and shadows and patterns. And uh, by the way, I think it's Numbers 13 when God says, uh, he says to Moses, he says, uh, to other prophets, I speak in dreams and visions and mysteries. But to Moses, to Moses face to face. And then Moses asked him to see God, and the text says, you know, like I said, God and Moses spoke face to face. But then you have other texts that say that anybody who sees God will die. So what's going on? Moses, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't Yahweh, it wasn't the actual God of Israel that Moses saw. 
It was his messenger. It was his vassal. It was his representative. The angel or the messenger whose name is in him. So, and you actually get a recapitulation of that, of that scene in the book of Numbers. You get a recapitulation of this in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, now Moses is standing in front of Yahweh's angel, and it's Christ. With that being said, though, with, 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 with the Susan and Vassal Treaty, I'm, I'm going to add one thing, one last thing in there. And uh, any other questions or whatever you have, feel, feel free to jump on me. So where where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? Because I am a Trinitarian. Where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? Okay. When kingdoms were run, you would have a father. The father would give his kingdom to his son. And the third element in this passing of the baton would be something called, now this is Akkadian, uh, this comes from Mesopotamia, but almost every ancient or eastern kingdom had this train of thought. There's something called the Melamu, that's Akkadian. So the Melamu is basically the glory, or it is uh, the essence, or it is uh, the radiance of, uh, of a god or of a deity. So usually uh, a god would give a king his melamu, and that melamu would make that king shine like the sun. It would make it would make him emit brightness, and this melamu would then pass from the high king to the low king. There's a message to my madness while I'm explaining this, and while I'm explaining this, I'm actually going to get the. Uh, I'm going to get the citation from uh, my Craig Keener commentary, so give me a second. Matter of fact, it should be right here. Boom, there we go. Here we go right here. Um, which one do I want to use? So this is my NIV cultural study commentary on the Melamu. So what is the Melamu? An Akkadian text, the equivalent of the empowering spirit of God is the awesome radiance, Melamu, possessed by gods and at times granted to kings. Uh, the brilliant light stands for numinous quality that seems to reflect a major literary and iconic, iconographic feature of Mesopotamian culture. So, uh, and the last one I want to read from is, if I can find it. I think it was. I'm gonna scroll up. Sorry. Can I find it? Yes. So this is my NIV cultural study commentary on Psalms 920, and it says basically the Melamu is the concept of deity having an awesome, unapproachable appearance was not limited to Israelite theology. For in Mesopotamia. The gods displayed their power through their melamu, their divine brilliance. The splendor or glory of God overwhelms the enemy. So you had this idea of something called the melamu. The melamu was power, and it, it, it made a king shine really, really, really bright. And when the king would get the melamu or when he would get the spirit of the god, the people would know that they have to listen to him. So why am I explaining this? You see bits and pieces of this in the Old Testament. You see this situation happen with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is about to go to heaven. Right? Eliyahu. Eliyahu is about to go to heaven. And Elisha says to Elijah, Give me a double portion of your spirit before you go. And Elijah gives it to him, right? A couple minutes before Elijah asked that request from Elisha, Elijah splits the Jordan River in half. He splits the Jordan River in two. So Elijah gets on his chariot when God sends it. Elijah ascends into heaven. And he goes into heaven with this you know, chariot of fire. And in the next scene afterward, Elisha takes his cloak, 
And just like Elijah split the Jordan River, Elisha splits the Jordan River now too. By the way, when Elijah is going up, Elisha says, my father, my father, I see you. Notice how the relationship between those two prophets was like a father and a son. And like a great king would pass on his melamu to his son, Elijah passes on his melamu or his, to his son, his spiritual son, Elisha. So you see this in the New Testament now. Remember, the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament. It's a reflection. It's a mirror. Jesus is on this mountain. Some people say he was on Mount Bashan. Jesus is on Mount Bashan, and he's talking to Moses and Elijah. And remember we talked about in Susan uh, treaties, at the end of your Susan treaty, you will have divine witnesses. Well, Moses and Elijah, that, that's why that scene is going on. Moses and Elijah are divine witnesses. And what are they about to witness? Well, the text tells you what they witness. They're standing on this mountain with Jesus. The disciples wake up. Peter starts talking crazy. I think I should build a tabernacle, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. As Peter is talking, a cloud overtook all of them. And Jesus starts to shine as bright as the sun. And what did I just say? In the ancient world, if you had the Melamu from a God, it meant that the people should listen to you. And what does God say out of the cloud? This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. As Jesus is showing his radiance, he's showing his glory, he's, brighty, he's shining bright like the sun, he's showing that he has the Melamu. So you have these three elements of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, or the Father, the Son, and the Melamu. That existed in almost every ancient Near Eastern culture. They all had a Father and a Son who were united together in their spirit. And this is the ancient understanding of the Trinity. The Trinity didn't just drop out the sky. People didn't just make the, 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 the Trinity in the second century or the third century. This is ancient. You can put your Bible down and you can see these aspects in other ancient cultures that predate your Bible. Because remember, God is using culture that they're already familiar with, that they already know, so he can accommodate his message with them and they can understand. So nothing wrong with somebody saying they're Trinitarian or somebody saying they believe God is a Trinity, but the way how our ancient ancestors got there will be completely different than how we get there today. So if you, if you got any questions, bro, or anything you want to say, anything, let me know. Hopefully I wasn't running my mouth for too long. Hopefully I edify some people. Um, but, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it, man. That's pretty much um, the, the the Trinitarian aspect from an ancient or Eastern point of view, and uh, hopefully that blessed somebody, man. No, man, uh, I thank you for – for this coming on and sharing that information, we got to get you to come back and do a part two. And hopefully we could deal more with the, um, the near Eastern perspective of the honor and shame and various other things that come that line up, it comes with that. Um, but before we even go, you know what I'm saying? Is there anything you would like, is there anything in particular you would like to share? Is there any more, uh, matter of fact, hold, is there any more you want to share before we do anything <laughs> else? Is there any more I want to share? Um, there is uh there there's one there's one other thing I could share that could probably edify people. Um and before I do, I'm uh sh- shameless plug, man, shameless plug. If you guys want to learn more about the ancient and eastern culture, um definitely go to my website and get my book, www.anesecrets.com. A as in N or as in Apple, N as in Nicole, E as in Eastern, A N E Secrets dot com. Um, and yeah, I, I do want to share this one last thing. Um, and let me let me know um, if you press for time or anything. No, go ahead, brother. You good? You good? 
Okay. So there's something else that we can take away from Luke chapter 9, or Luke chapter 9, 29 to uh, 32, when Jesus transfigures like the sun. That's in Luke chapter 9. People's favorite verse is Philippians, Philippians 2, 6. And we argue about what this means all the time. You know, when, I, when I'm on Clubhouse, this is people's favorite verse. And when they're bringing up Philippians 2, 6, this is what's going on in my mind. So I'm going to read from verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Right? So we argue about this, and we use this as an argument to say Jesus is God. You know, Jesus preexisted, yada, yada, yada. The, the word used for form is, uh, is morphe, and there's a lot of different um, interpretations of that word or a lot of different definitions of that word. As a matter of fact, I got a Greek lexicon right now on me. This is uh, Philippians 2, 6, because I'm going to rattle off the definitions to you. And I'm going, I'm going to explain why even when you look at lexicons sometimes, the definitions of a lot of words, Unless you understand culturally what the idea they're trying to communicate, the Greek lexicon sometimes won't help you. The only thing a lot of times that, that will really help you is understanding the culture. Okay, so my lexicon, yep, morphe. Morphe is, it can be translated as the expression of something, the expression of something such as a visual, spatial, or preternatural expression that reflects or manifests fully and truly and permanently the essence of what something is. It can mean form, shape, comeliness, shapeliness, shape, beauty, or form. None of those definitions actually explain what Morphe actually is, by the way. So we'll argue about, well, Jesus was in the form of God, and he, became, he took on the form of a servant. What we think this is talking about in the West this ain't talking about anything of what we think it's talking about. So let me bring out another anchor, another anchor passage. So an anchor passage to this would be 1 Samuel 28, verse 8. This is when Samuel goes to visit the witch of Endor. It was a crime to go visit uh, an enchantress or a witch in Israel. That was against the law. So King Saul knows this is against the law, and look at what he does. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. In Philippians 2, 6, when it says being in the form of God, those definitions don't help at all. But the best way to culturally understand Philippians 2, 6 is to understand that as a king putting on other clothes, like King Saul did in the Old Testament. So a better way to understand Philippians 2, 6 is that Jesus put on other robes, or he put on other clothes, and he put on the clothes of a servant. What does this have to do with anything? Remember, we just talked about the Milamu. We just talked about Jesus transfiguring. Now I'm going to go to this in my Bible. It's uh, Luke 9. I'm going to start from 29. Now, with everything I just said, keep that in mind. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared, and some translations say, who appeared in glorious splendor and spoke of his departure. This is what Philippians 2 is talking about. This is what John 17 is talking about. When Jesus is talking to God and he says, God, return me to the glory that I had in the beginning of the universe. The reason why we keep having arguments about Jesus' preexistence and whether or not he had glory is because we don't understand that in the ancient world, when we say glory today, we mean glory in a very abstract type of way 
But in the ancient Near East, glory was literally actual, tangible clothing. It was the clothing of the divine. So when Jesus says in John 17, bring back the glory I had at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the world, in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus transfigures like the sun, that was the glory that he had. That Philippians said he took off. The form or the other clothes that God took off and he put on the clothes of a servant, that is very much talking about very tangible things. Glory is the transfiguration clothes that Jesus had on when he shined like the sun. The form of God was tangible. It's not physical, by the way. Moses and Elijah didn't have physical bodies, but it's tangible. It's a real thing, and it's talking about heavenly clothing, heavenly robes. So I say that to say we keep having these arguments because we don't understand what these people actually mean. We don't understand what Jesus means. A lot of times when people when people uh, read John 17, they think Jesus is saying, Return me, return me to the reputation that I had at the beginning of the world. Or return me to the status that I had at the beginning of the world. Very abstract things. But no, the glory that Jesus is asking for and the form that Jesus took off at the beginning of the world that Philippians talks about, um, or the form that Jesus took off, these were, well, not physical. These were tangible things. Just like uh, King Saul put on other clothes in the Old Testament. By the way, when King Saul, when he put on other robes, notice that Saul leaves with two men. The king puts on other clothes, and he leaves with two men. He puts on a disguise. And what disguise would Saul have put on? Saul would have took off the robe of a king, and he would have put on the robes or the clothes of a servant. So he could be in disguise with those two men. That is what you see in Luke chapter 9. Jesus, at first, he has on the form or he has on the clothes of a servant. And then his true glory or his true heavenly robes is shown for what they truly are. So that's a little jewel I wanted to throw in there. And uh, just to get people to think and understand, sometimes what we think the biblical authors are talking about, they're talking about something completely different. And we need to have context when we're looking into these things. So I don't know if you still there. I don't know if I, if I talk your head off, but I just want to throw that in there. Bro, you did not talk, you did not talk your head off. You, bro, it's, um, I, it's a beautiful thing to have you come on here, my brother, and just share your information. And that's what it's all about on Debate Talk for You slash the Man Up segment. We want to hear the information. doesn't matter if we agree or disagree. The information is there, and it's on the public to go do the research to confirm what you have brought out today. And, brother, I was truly edified because there were some, most definitely some things I was aware of, and there were some things today that I learned that was fairly new to me. So, man, you know me, bro. I'm going to do the research, and I know how to contact you personally. We're going to build on some of these things because it's always good to hear something different we didn't hear no ideology. We didn't hear no doctrine. We sticking within the historical and social context of the scriptures. And people don't have to believe it, but do your research and tap into it. So I want to ask Sal. Yo, Sal, do we have any callers, anyone that's pressed the one that would like to chime in, ask any questions or comments or observations? Yeah, right now, nobody's pressing number one at this time. But uh, I definitely want to get the website information, my brother, for that aspect. For those who want to check out your book, uh, just say one more time, and I can type it in the description box for those who want to purchase it. What's your book again? Yeah. Oh, you... It's uh, yes. www. Um, a as in N or as in Apple, uh, N as in Nicole, E as in Eastern, A N E Secrets.com. And what you can do, Roy, just send me the link to your um, to your website, and I can send that to Sal. You know what I'm saying? That he could put it in the um, subscription box on the YouTube channel because I'm pretty sure we're going to play this live on the YouTube channel and there will be other people who will be able to hear it on the YouTube. Will do. Will do. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure, bro. It's been a pleasure just to be able and just 
talk scholarship, man. We don't really get a chance to do this a lot, man. Um, so definitely appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And for those who are listening, the Man Up segment, Most High Willie, will continue to come back every two weeks. Uh, two weeks from now, I most definitely will come on myself, and I'm going to build more on the Most High God, Yahweh, or Hashem being a servant. And then two weeks after that, I got a surprise. <laughs> I got I got, I got, a hot one. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be mad at me for this one I got coming up in about a month from now. But like I said, I'll as time progresses, I'll share bits and pieces and promote it. But, Sal, if there's no one pressing one, and I guess we're going to call it a wrap for the day. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation through PayPal. The email is debatingtalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. <laughs>